In 13th century Florence, the relevance of the feudal nobility is dying. There are certain families in Italy and in Florence whose power is tethered to the enduring administrative and military presence of the Hohenstaufen German family that is currently serving as emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. In the year 1250, the last of these, Frederick II, dies. And with him goes the military security of all of these magnates referred to as Ghibellines. These old feudal families are rich in land and they make their money by selling the agricultural surplus off of their estates. Now in the 13th century, their wealth has been outstripped by a new mercantile class participating in a much more complex economy selling finished products. These new wealthy families are known as Guelphs. The prize over which these two factions clash is political control within each of the commercial centers in Tuscany through which they can set regulatory economic policy in a manner that suits themselves. In the 1250s, the Guelphs of Florence see their opportunity. In that city, they are in control, and the Ghibellines are a minority. Another city in Tuscany, however, Siena, is in control of the Ghibellines. Their leader is Farinata degli Uberti. With 70,000 troops, the Florentine Guelphs march on Siena. Despite being favored by overwhelming numbers, they are defeated at the famous Battle of Monteperdi on November 3rd, 1260. They are massacred, and the Ghibellines, after this battle, are able to take Florence for themselves. But they can only hold it for so long, and in 1267, with the help of the French, the Guelphs are back in control. Things start to go well, and Florence starts to make lots of money. Silks, furs, dyes, taffeta, all sorts of commerce flows. There's bankers, doctors, lawyers, and they form guilds over the course of the 1270s and 1280s. But there are still problems. Not only are the Guelphs of Florence still bashing it out with the Ghibellines all across Tuscany, but even the factions themselves, the Guelphs and Ghibellines, are not exactly always true to each other. We see this in the example of 1288. When the leader of the city of Pisa, a man by the name of Ugolino della Gerardesca, has his city hit by a horrible food price spike that leads to shortages. And a certain Bishop Ruggieri incites the populace against him and comes to burn him out of the town hall. After his arrest, he is locked in a tower with two sons and one grandson left there to starve. They die first and he dies after eating their dead bodies. This entire scandal, however, demonstrates everything that sucks about Italy. And the irrelevance of the fact that these two factions are going at it is but a subterfuge for the underlying issues of manipulation by the bastards of the world traders in the corn market in Florence. Swindlers, money lenders, and money changers protected by armed guards have the ability to short markets, mess with futures markets, and cause the scarcity, cause the price fluctuations. Profiting, both politically and economically, off of famine. Humans being too stupid to solve problems, we take it out on demographics. The end result in Florence? Whites representing the working class, blacks representing the nobility, vying for power of the city. Never mind that they're both Guelphs. The whites are in control because of their militia and their numbers. But in 1301, the blacks take over the city with the help of Pope Boniface VIII. Prosecutions against whites take place. Some are condemned to the stake. One of them is named Dante Alighieri. He must flee Florence and public execution. Despising political corruption, despising greed, despising the ill humor and violence that tramples the happiness that should be certain in the paradise of the Italian peninsula, the poet picks up his pen and prepares himself to toss these villains into the cauldron of his inferno, writing in Canto 3, through me you pass into the city of woe, through me you pass into eternal pain, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. In Canto 1, we find Dante wandering through a dark wood. 
he's going to be confronted by three animals, each with a symbol, you know, leper, uh, the leopard, the symbol of lust, then the wolf symbolizing greed, the lion symbolizing pride. And we're going to get something that is a little bit of a theme already here. Dante is kind of a wimp. So we get the introduction of the wolf. This is line 49. Next a wolf, greediness itself, oozing from her famished body, the cause of hurt to so many. This image of an animal representing greed being a famished entity, the famished predator, much like the description of the lion, which he writes, was mad with hunger, so even the air seems terrified. The hunger of the lion terrifies the air, and then the famished wolf scares him just from her look. What is interesting is that he has not assigned the terrible aspects of these animals with their physical capacity to do harm. Just think about that for a moment. He has said nothing about either the lion or the wolf about their physical capacity to do harm. What makes them terrifying is their deprivation. And when we see the words about the lion in particular, that he is mad with hunger such that the very air is terrified, I find these to be the words of a poet who knows what it's like to see an uprising that is fueled by starvation and what the atmosphere is in a city in which starvation has fueled a popular revolt and that from their mere aspect their deprivation can be deduced. It is from this deprived aspect that he shrinks. This is when his guide appears, Virgil. Virgil's appearance comes online. 61. Now, as I plummeted downwards, a figure rose before my eyes, hoarse from long silence, it seemed. So then Virgil introduces him. And, and here's what Virgil says about the sin of greed. Her nature's one so monstrous, she'll never fill her greedy guts. After she eats, she's hungriest. This description of the nature of greed, this is an indication we need to watch out as we tread through this. I see this as a shot across our bow as we row through the waters of Dante's mind. This description of greed. We must be prepared to deal with a great poet's definition of this thing which may jar with ours. We must be prepared for this. What has he just said? Part of the nature of greed is to not comprehend when you are fed. Isn't that what he's saying? When it's fed, it's hungriest. That's a profound statement. What he has done here is imply that the sin of greed is not necessarily or not exclusively connected with how much food is in your stomach. That there's more to the assessment. The sin of greed is connected to other things than how much you have. In Canto 2, we find out that there are three women in heaven who are lobbying for Dante to be able to go on this journey. One is Beatrice. Beatrice is Dante's former love, but she very tragically died at the age of 25. Um, so she's one, and she's going to be his guide. Virgil is going to guide him through hell and purgatory, but then Beatrice is going to take over. The other two are St. Lucy, the patron the patron saint of the weak-sighted. So apparently uh, Dante was weak-sighted. How many weak-sighted people are there? He has that in common with Milton then, who went blind in later life, and Rachel, one of Jacob's two wives. So he's got these three women interceding for him. I mean, it's line 124. Since three holy ladies like these plead for you in heaven's, in heaven's court, this is what Virgil tells him. And this will be the this is the inspiration he needs to keep going. We also get the detail that Virgil is stuck in limbo. Uh, normally, this is a break from limbo to enjoy this uh, journey with Dante. We're going to find out about lind limbo later as we get to Canto Three. Um, he, he, now we see the gates of hell, right? With those words that I already read. And so here's here is the next thing. We see some suffering souls. 
Hear sighs and sobs and screams echo through the starless night and have me in tears at first. Strange cries and awful language, moans of pain or anger, voices shrill or faint, sounds of blows, they all make a great confusion whirling in the changeless dark like sand swept up in a storm. Okay, so we're starting to see the torture of the damned, except these really aren't quite damned. These are people who aren't even invited into hell. They can't get into either heaven or hell. Virgil explains, line 34, this miserable state, it's for the sad souls who lived without blame, without praise. So this is something. Here's an even another interesting line. They're not down in deep hell since guilt might glory in them. Hell might be a compliment to them, is what he's saying. And setting aside the extreme that we're talking about, hell, you can see this in life. Have you ever met a person who seemed a little too proud to tell you about something naughty they did? Have you ever bumped into that? You know, as though their worst fear is a banal first first impression? I may work in accounting, but I've been to Vegas. Boo ha ha ha. Do you know know this type of person? I could just picture Dante in a conversation with someone like that thinking, you're such a phony, they wouldn't even let you into hell. Both God and the devil agree you're a fucking bore. I I mean, this is how Virgil treats it. Line 51 of Canto 3. They're not worth words. Look, pass. And that's it. These non-entities. Line 64. Who never lived. Included in this are the angels who sat out the war in heaven are down here but just because they're not allowed into hell doesn't mean that they're not being tortured we see this line 65 they're pestered by followings of flies and wasps biting the blood from their faces blood tears trickle to their feet where vile worms lapped it up so we're starting to see the delightfully macabre grotesque images we're gonna get in dante's inferno and as canto three comes to an end he's finally approaching of what is going to be the first circle of hell the sad earth belched out wind then a flash of crimson lightning knocked out all of my senses and i fell as if seized by sleep